Okay, hello everyone. I think we can start now. Um, just before we start, uh, I have a few questions for you. How many of you know what a security manager is in Java? A couple of people, okay. How many of you do some kind of security programming for Java? Okay, just a few people. Um, so during this talk, basically, we'll uh, discuss what is the security architecture of the Java platform. Uh, and just before we start, a few short words about me. My name is Martin. I'm currently a consultant working through my own company called Coffee Cup Consulting. Um, I'm also one of the guys who organizes the events of the Bulgarian Java user group along with a few other people. And I'm also a big Open JDK and Oracle enthusiast. You can chat with me on any Open JDK and Oracle related topics after the session. Uh, recently, I also wrote a book on RabbitMQ. So if any one of you is interested in the topic, uh, you can find me, we can discuss um, not only RabbitMQ, but uh, messaging solutions in general. And during this talk, um, we'll first discuss what is the security architecture of the Java platform as it is today. Then we'll basically fulfill that uh, discussion with um, an overview of what are the different security APIs that are provided by the JDK and that US Java developers can use considering the Java security sandbox model. And at the end, uh, we'll cover what we've learned with a few best practices that you need to consider that are specific uh, to the Java technology stack. So um, the Java security model. Traditionally, from time immemorial, companies have always tried to protect their assets, whether that's physical, whether that's software, or any type of asset that the company owns. And for that reason, if many of you start a new company, sometimes you are given a security policy that you need to read and understand. Um, f additionally to that, many companies de deploy different types of intrusion protection systems, firewalls, antivirus systems, in order to make sure that whatever goes into, into the, um, their network is as secure as possible. However, with the introduction of uh, various technologies that allow you to execute source code from the browser, such as, for example, Java applets, a whole new range of security concerns emerges. And this is when basically the security sandbox model of the Java platform starts to evolve. It basically deals uh, with the possibility to execute code in an unsecured environment such as the user's browser. And the goal essentially of the Java security uh, sandbox model is to allow basically initially untrusted code from applets to be executed in a safe environment such as the user's browser. This model, however, evolves to a more wider range of use cases, such as today we have a number of uh, Java e application servers, we have different OSGI environments, we have different types of Java managed environments that need in one or another form to execute source code in a user's environment. And that needs basically to be protected well. And that's one of the goals, the main goal of the Java security sandbox model. So in version 1.0, I'll tell you a short story of how this model evolved so you understand basically what we have today. In version 1.0, the model was pretty simple. We had the user's browser installed with some JVM, and the system code that came from the JVM was deemed as trusted, meaning that it cannot, it could do whatever it wanted to do with the, f with the user's system. For example, to write to the file system, open a network socket, and so on and so forth. And on the other hand, we had applets that were loaded from the browser, such as, for example, an applet loaded from vox.com slash demo applet. And all of those applets that were loaded externally were, were deemed as untrusted. And it was as simple as that. So basically, the code executed in the JVM in version 1.0 was divided into two domains, a trusted and an untrusted one. And strict restrictions were applied to the second one, to the untrusted domain. In version 1.1, however, some more flexibility was introduced. In 1.1, something called applet signing was introduced, which basically allowed the ability to move uh, applets from the untrusted domain to the trusted one. When you basically sign an applet, you say that you trust that, that applet, and it, can, it has the same permissions as basically the system code of the JVM. And this was a new addition in 1.1 that allowed you to, to give more permissions to, to the code that you execute in the browser. And um, signed applets now are deemed as trusted, and still you can have applets that are not trusted, which are not signed. 
And the process of applet signing is pretty straightforward. Just to cover it in a few steps, you need to compile the applet, then I create a jar file, generate some public private keys, then you need to sign the private key, um, the applet jar with the private key, then to export, you need to export the certificate for the public key, import that uh, certificates in a Java trusted store, create a policy file, as we shall see in a few moments, and finally load and run the applet. And this is basically the process of how you can sign an applet. Now, in version 1.2, this model was still not very flexible. And at the time, the teams at Sun decided to, to provide some more flexibility. And in 1.2 was um, basically a radical change in the security model of the Java plot platform, which is valid until today. So it was uh, release 1.2 that introduced the security model of the platform as we know it today. And what was introduced in JDK 1.2 was uh, first a security, the ability to specify permissions in a so-called security policy file, which resides in your JDK installation. And on the other hand, uh, this, the notion of a security manager was introduced and an access controller class. Both of those two utilities allow you to do permission checking as specified in a security policy file. The security policy file itself has a, um, is uh, written in a domain-specific language. Uh, and it specifies basically from what, lo what location of, of your applets, uh, what permission to grant to that location. So, for example, from all of the applets that you load from voxcom slash demo applet, uh, you give the permission to delete the CWindows folder. Um, and basically, to check whether you're currently executing source code has that permission, you need to use a security major or an access controller. And this is basically the security model that was introduced in version 1.2. And now the security model with this introduction becomes more code-centric, meaning that you now specify permissions based on the location of wh where your source code is loaded from. Um, and additional, of course, uh, access control decisions are specified in the security policy file as we saw it. And there is no more the notion of trusted and untrusted domain as we had before JDK 1.2. However, another thing was introduced which, was, which is called protection domain. And the protection domains are two types, system and application. Uh, the, the JVM source code is in the system protection domain, and uh, all other uh, applets that are loaded in the JVM are in the application protection domain. And the idea behind the protection domain, essentially, is that you can get it from any class uh, that you load in the JVM. Uh, you can say get class dot get protection domain. And that thing basically allows you to return the location of where your class was loaded from. For example, if this was an applet, uh, this basically uh, can allow you to, to take the location of where your source code is loaded from. For example, this is vox.com slash demo applet. And the other thing you can take from the protection domain is the set of permissions that apply to that Java class. Um, this, this you can do basically with any class in the, in the platform that you load. Uh, there are in some interesting properties of permissions that are introduced as well. For example, if you specify a permission um, that allows you to delete the CWindows folder, this automatically implies uh, the ability to delete the CWindows system32 folder. So one permission can imply another permission. And as you can see, basically permissions are specified uh, in terms of three distinct parts. The first part is the type of the permission. It could be a file permission. It could be a socket permission. The JVK out of the box defines a number of different types of permissions. Uh, the second thing basically is the, um, the location of where that applies. Basically, it's a target for the permission. And the third thing is the action for that permission. So basically, all of the permissions are specified in that manner in the JDK. And another interesting property is that if you specify a location in the properties file, in the security policy file, this means that, for example, if you specify permissions for uh, any applets loaded from vox.com, this implies that the same set of permissions applies for applets loaded from vox.com slash demo applet. These are two important properties um, of the security policy file. Um, now, there is another interesting thing, basically, and that's uh, since basically you can have multiple threads of execution that potentially pass through different class loaders. And as you know, basically, the, the protection domain um, of each class that's loaded in the JVM is set during class loading. This means that basically uh, when you execute some source code, uh, that source code may pass through different threads of execution uh, 
and through different basically classes that are loaded potentially from different class loaders. And basically now you need to think of how in that case we need to determine what's the active set of permissions. We have, for example, one class that's, ex that's executed from different frame that passes through different class loaders. And at the time, basically, the team at Sun decided to, to take um, the permission of all uh, the, the intersection of all of the protections in all of the protection domains through which an execution passes. And that's effectively the, the active set of permissions. To give you an example of this, for example, you have a WAR file and you load that WAR file in an application server. Uh, you have some uh, logic basically that uh, writes to a log file inside of your WAR file and the logging service is given by the application server. Now when you write to the log file basically, the currently executing source code passes through the uh, protection domain of the WAR file, which is loaded by one class loader, and also by the protection domain of the application server, which is loaded by another class loader. And the active set of permissions for that particular um, piece of logic essentially is the intersection of permissions that are given to the application server and to the WAR file. Um, in JDK 1.3 and 1.4, the security model basically remains the same. However, there is something new introduced called JAS. Uh, how many of you know what JAS is? Okay, a couple of people. Uh, so JAS basically is the Java Authentication and Authorization Service. And the idea of JAS is basically to, to extend the Java security model with the ability to specify who executes the source code. For now, up to JDK 1.2, you, you can only specify permissions based on the location of where your classes are loaded from. But now, um, in JDK 1.3, another aspect was introduced, and that's the ability to specify who is the user to which those permissions are bound. And you basically bind that user to a particular Java class. Uh, and also just extends the syntax of the security policy file. In that particular example, I say grant principle. I have some LDAP principle, which is basically some LDAP property. And that principle has a property of name Tom. And basically that user, which has the attribute of uh, name Tom, can have the permission to delete the C Windows folder. Uh, in that way, basically, I can specify now not only a location from where my applet is loaded from, but who is the currently authenticated user uh, that has the permission to do that thing. And I can also combine the two things. I can specify here a location that's combined with the particular user attribute. Uh, this is what JAS introduce, uh, introduces in the JDK platform. Uh, JAS, however, um, extends the security model with role-based permissions. And now the protection domain, as we, as we saw it earlier, is also extended with the ability to get the currently uh, the active user that's authenticated in your application. Uh, so now when you say get protection domain, you can also say uh, get call get subject to get the currently active user that executes your source code. Um, and basically, JAS contains two parts, authentication and authorization. It's the authorization part of JAS that effectively extends the syntax of the security policy file. And the authorization part of JAS is based on the so-called pluggable authentication modules. You can specify different login modules and use them in your application to authenticate users. For example, you have a uh, login module for authenticating against an LDAP server. You have a login module to authenticate against a relational database. You can create your own and so, for, so on and so forth. And in, in JAS, basically, you can combine the different login modules. For example, you can say, I want to authenticate against an LDAP server. And if that fails, try to authenticate against a relational database. And you can combine the authentication schemes using different, um, different rules. Now, um, to cover JAS uh, with just a few classes, these are basically the core classes of JAS. Uh, first, you have the login context class, which is the starting point of JAS. From that login context, basically, you can authenticate a uh, user by calling login. And to that login context, basically, you can have one or more login modules defined, which are defined in the configuration of JAS. It's a configuration file that resides in your application. A login module could be, as we said, an LDAP login module, a relational database login module, and so on and so forth. Each login module is responsible for authenticating a user and creating a subject. A subject represents the actively authenticated user in your application. And a subject has one or more principles, which are the attributes of the user. This could be, for example, an LDAP principle, 
which is some attribute of the user in the LDAP server. Or this could be, for example, the email address if you authenticate against a, a relational database, and so on and so forth. So this is basically how JAS works uh, in general. These are the core classes of uh, JAS. Um, now, to summarize basically what we have up to JDK 1.4, first, when you start up your application, uh, for example, if you start up an application server, he, it is responsible to install a security manager. A security manager is installed by simply calling system.securitymanager and passing an instance of the security manager class. Uh, also, the, the JDK sets up the, the currently active policy file that's specified in your JDK installation by calling policy.setPolicy and creating a new instance of a policy file of a policy class that basically represents the contents of the security policy. This is the first step when you start up basically um, the JVM with, uh, with an application server or uh, with an applet class loader, for example. Now, the second thing is uh, the, the JVM starts to load the classes of your application. And for that reason, during class loading, essentially, there are a number of things that are being done by the JVM. For example, we have bytecode verification to make sure that the, the bytecode of, of your classes comply to the Java language specification. Uh, and after basically class loading is done, the, the protection domain is set uh, along with the source code from where, where your classes are loaded from, the set of permissions are specified in the security policy file, and the set of just principles, which are essentially the, the users that you authenticate. And when system code basically is invoked from your um, Java application, the JVM uses the installed security manager to check whether the currently uh, executing source code has the ability to do something uh, based on the permissions that it has. Uh, how does the JVM do permission checking? Behind the scenes, uh, what the JVM does and what many Java application servers and other managed environments do, they create an instance of the particular permission that needs to be checked. Uh, for example, I, need, I create an instance of a socket permission that basically specifies that I can basically connect to Vox.com from ports 8000 to 9000. Then I check whether I have a security manager installed. And I do this by getting an instance of the currently installed security manager. And if I have a security manager installed in my JVM, um, I do a security manager dot check permission, and I specify that permission. Uh, this, the last line essentially is the most, most essential one, because this invocation here, sm dot check permission, basically traverses the current call stack and checks that each class in the current call stack has the permission to, uh, to create that socket permission. If there is an, even a one class in your uh, current stack trace that doesn't have that permission, a security exception is thrown by the JVM. Uh, alternatively, you can also do permission checking using the access controller utility, which is essentially a newer utility uh, than the security manager. And the security manager behind the scenes actually uses access controller. The difference is that basically you don't need to, to have a security manager installed, for example, as part of your application server startup. Uh, and what you can do basically to use the access controller class, you again create the socket permission in the similar manner. However, you can use a static check permission method from the access controller class to check whether the currently executing source code has that permission. As you can see here, we don't need to have a Java security manager installed to do that. Um, and also, there are a couple of things that uh, the currently executing source code can do. For example, you can uh, have escalate privileges of the currently executing source code by calling access controller .do privileged. What this does basically is that it basically skips the current stack, uh, call stack and also only checks permissions of the source code that's being executed as part of the block that's specified in the do privileged call. That can be useful in a number of scenarios. If I give you, again, the example of a Java application server, if you have a WAR file that needs to write to, the lock, to a lock file, but that WAR file is not given the permission to write to the file system, uh, then the application server needs somehow to allow the particular WAR file um, to write to the, lock uh, to, the, to the file system, and in particular to the lock file. And for that reason, um, for example, when you say some logging service dot um, lock something, the application behind the scenes can do this call in the logging uh, service uh, 
to allow basically the war file to write to, to the file system. This means basically that the permissions of the war file are just skipped and the active set of permissions for that particularly executing source code is, are the ones of the application server only. Another thing you can do is to change the, currently, uh, the current subject of the source code, meaning that you can switch users at runtime that execute the source code. And you can also combine the previous two by saying uh, subject.do as privileged, uh, meaning that you can switch the user and escalate privileges at the same time. Um, now, the security model that's defined by the security manager, as we saw it, is highly customizable. Uh, for example, one interesting imp uh, application of that security model is in the Oracle database. Uh, you have the ability to execute Java stored procedures in the Oracle database. And for that, those stored procedures, you can specify different permissions in a relational database table. And the security manager that's used inside the uh, Oracle JVM that runs in the Oracle database has a custom implementation of the Java Security Manager that basically checks for permissions that are stored in a relational database table rather than in a security policy file. You can also create your own implementation of a Security Manager, but you have to be very careful because uh, a few subtle mistakes in, the, in your implementation can open some security gaps. Um, in JDK 1.5 and 1.6, the security model remains the same. Uh, however, there are some new additions, uh, such as, for example, some more uh, an LDAP support for JAS that's introduced in JDK 1.6. In JDK 1.7 and 1.8, still some more enhancements. For example, one of uh, one of the major ones is that in the do privileged call, you have this possibility to specify also explicitly a set of permissions, and this means that you can further restrict the set of permissions that you give to an elevated um, execution of your source code. And in JDK 1.9, um, how many of you have heard of Project Jigsaw? OK, quite a lot of people. So as you know, basically, uh, Project Jigsaw um, has two main purposes. First is to split the JDK code base into smaller, more manageable modules. And the other, um, which is the, the less important uh, at the moment, is the ability to give developers the ability to write, the, write their own uh, Jigsaw modules. So as basically the JDK is split into different types of modules, and your application can also constitute of different types of modules, each module can, have, can be loaded from a different location, which means that basically each particular Jigsaw module can have a different set of permissions again, based on the location of where that module is loaded from. And based also on that fact, this means that the security model applies directly for uh, Java modules in a similar manner as it applies for um, Java classes as we know them for now. Uh, and this means that Project Jigsaw, essentially what we'll introduce in terms of the security model of the JDK is the fact that some modules in the JVM may have higher or lesser number of privileges um, based on what they do. For example, uh, previously, as you know, the JDK is one big monolith, but now as we have, for example, a separate module for Java Util logging, that module may have less permissions than it had previously in the JVM. That's one implication of the splitting of the JDK into different modules. Um, so yeah, the security model remains the same in JDK 1.9 as well. Now, this was the security sandbox model of the JVM. However, the, on the other side of the coin, we have a number of APIs that allow you as Java developers to basically uh, write more secure applications. And we'll just cover briefly what are those APIs. Um, the security model, um, as we saw, it basically defines strict model for execution of remote code in the JVM. And um, on the other side, we have those APIs, which in short are the JCA, which is the Java cryptography architecture, we have the public key infrastructure utilities. We have the um, secure equivalent of standard Java sockets, which is called JSSE or Java Secure Socket Extension. And we have an alternative for Java Secure Socket Extension, which is called Java GSS API. We'll cover very briefly each one of them. And uh, last but not least, we have Java SASL API or the Java Simple Authentication and Security Layer, which is essentially an API which allows you to exchange security information between communicating parties, for example, between a client and a server. So going very briefly through each one of them, uh, the Java cryptography architecture provides different types of utilities for creation of uh, message digest, digital signatures, and so on and so forth. The JDK in particular, 
doesn't provide you with concrete algorithms that, uh, for example, create um, digital signatures or cryptographic shifters. Uh, basically, it provides the API that allows different providers or Java libraries to implement the different types of algorithms. And for example, to, to give just one example of a provider that uh, gives a lot of utilities for the Java cryptography architecture, that's the Bouncy Castle library uh, that's been quite used uh, for that reason. Um, so basically, the Java cryptography architecture is pluggable. As we mentioned, you can also write your own cryptographic algorithm that you need to use, and that's managed by the JDK. Um, and the Java cryptography ar architecture continues to evolve. Uh, it provides basically APIs that allow you to manage stronger types of cryptographic algorithms. The PKI utilities or the public key infrastructure utilities uh, provide you with different means that um, you can use to manage uh, certificates, uh, to have certificate revocation lists, which are basically lists published by a um, uh, security authority that allow you to specify which certificates basically are um, not valid for some reason. An alternative of, of uh, CRLs is the OCSP protocol, which is another way you can use to check whether a certificate is valid or not against the certificate authority. And also the PKI utilities allow you to deal with trusted and key stores uh, in the JDK. Um, this is a very brief diagram that describes basically the process and the, you can use basically the utilities to either check whether a certificate is valid uh, using a certificate revocation list or the OCSP protocol or you can use the PKI utilities to create your own certificate authority uh, using the, uh, the JDK utilities that are provided for, it, for the purpose. Uh, the Java Secure Socket extension provides, uh, as we already mentioned, implementation of um, SSL sockets in the Java platform. Uh, and there are some enhancements that um, uh, are being actively added to the Java Secure Socket extensions. One of them is the so-called server name identification. This is basically the ability to have multiple kind of virtual domains in a single uh, server socket so that basically you can establish uh, multi-tenancy, let's say, at the level of the server socket. Um, the Java GSS API, it's an alternative to Java secure sockets, and you can use it to establish a secure channel for communication between parties. And the way basically the GSS framework works, works is by providing token-based services. So you basically use security tokens to exchange information between a client and a server and you can use it instead of uh, Java Secure Socket extensions. Um, another interesting thing about GSS is that it can be used along with uh, JAS for authentication purposes, and the GSS API continues to evolve, uh, especially in the support for different types of authentication protocols through which it can work. The Kerberos protocol is also token-based, and the GSS API basically provides integration with Kerberos and supports newer versions of the Kerberos protocol. The Java SASL framework we already mentioned, it's a, it's a framework that allows you to exchange security information between parties. For example, a client and the server want to communicate, and in order to establish the communication channel, a client may ask the server, hey, can I authenticate against you using an email address or a password? or a username and a password. And the server responds, OK, let's communicate using an email address and a password. And the client starts providing email and password as authentication um, data for the server. So the SASL framework provides you this ability to basically uh, create a negotiation between a client and a server. And the SASL utility also continues to evolve, especially in the ability to specify more and different types of properties uh, when you create that negotiation between the client and the server. Now, uh, considering basically the security APIs of the Java platform uh, and how basically the security sandbox model of the uh, JVM works, uh, let's see a few best practices that you as Java developers need to consider, especially when you develop uh, different types of libraries. Now, typically when you attend a session about security, most of the practices that you listen to and hear are not really related to any programming language, such as, for example, you need to, to, have, um, uh, to avoid basically SQL injection, you need to use safe types, you need to properly handle errors, and so on and so forth. However, there are some guidelines that are really specific to the JVM, and one of them is the, um, the ability to respect the security manager. 
Uh, there are many Java libraries out there that are written without considering the fact that they can be used in a managed environment like uh, Java E or OSGI. And this basically has some particular implications. Uh, to give you a concrete example of this, a few years ago I had um, to use the JSON library as part of an OSGI bundle. And interestingly enough, when I uh, uh, tried to bundle, uh, to use JSON as an OSGI bundle, uh, I had a security exception. Uh, the reason basically was uh, that the JSON library had some reflective calls to do the marshalling and unmarshalling of JSON. And uh, reflection basically is a subject of permission checking in an environment that has a security manager installed. And the JSON library didn't take into account the fact that it may need to escalate privileges uh, for the particular places of code that did basically the reflective calls in order to allow some particular source, co source code to do the marshalling and unmarshalling. And for that reason, basically, the JSON library had to be patched with those uh, privileged calls in order to allow it to run in an OSGI environment. Uh, there are many cases of this, and there are many libraries out there that basically don't consider the fact that uh, they may need to be used in an environment that has a security manager installed. So if you write a Java library, please take that into consideration as well. Uh, the other, t yes, question? For Java 9 module, <coughs> will there be a um, um, security manager be um, established as well? So same problems could be there? Uh, in particular, um, for Java 9, you mean if there is a, some different implementation of a security manager that will be provided for the reason? No, it or lies in some respects similar to uh, Java 9 modules. Yeah. So, and you just claim that there is Java. No. Yep. Will there be um, similar problems to Java 9 modules? That propagates essentially to Java 9. Because in, in an in OSGI environment that potentially may run on top of JDK 9, it will eventually use the same security majors without any, uh, any additional enhancements. So if you have the same problems in the previous versions, you'll have them in, in JDK 9 as well. Um, the other important thing is that you need to grant the minimal set of permissions. Uh, there are many cases when um, you get some kind of a security exception. In order to avoid it, you just go and specify all permissions. Uh, and this is really not good because basically this um, provides the source code the ability to do much more than it's intended to do. Uh, it could be very time consuming and annoying to specify particular permissions, uh, specific permissions for each particular um, location of where your classes are loaded from or each particular user. But uh, it's quite important, basically, to take into account that you need to specify just the minimal set of permissions in order to do the necessary job. Um, this is another interesting uh, principle that you need to take into account. And the other one is uh, quite general. Basically, um, you've seen many applications that when you use them and you get some kind of exception, that exception is shown to the user. You need to make sure that you sanitize properly exception stack traces and not show them to the users because that also conveys quite an important information about how your application is structured. And that can give also additional information to attackers to exploit basically uh, your application. And that's basically it. Any questions? Yes? Mm-hmm, exactly. Uh, well, typically, basically, it's the application server that needs to give the different permissions for the different WAR files. So basically, if, if a WAR file needs to, to customize that, uh, it's not allowed, basically, to specify different permissions than what the application server gives it. Th this was uh, the question? Yeah. Well, basically, that's the responsibility of the application server to define. Because you mentioned intersection, right? Yes, yes. Uh, intersection because the application server may specify certain permissions for certain set of WAR files. For example, some WAR files that are loaded from Vox.com, let's say. However, at some point, uh, those permissions might be too restrictive 
for from what the WAR files tries to achieve, what is, for example, the case with writing to the log file. And in that case, the, the application server for certain services internally, it may need to escalate privileges in order to write that, uh, allow that writing to the log file. And this is just one, one example. You can find another examples of this. Yeah, welcome. Other questions? Yes? So basically, uh, as far as I understand your question, the idea is whether you can specify permissions that allow you to, to do this custom kind of, of check, whether, for example, you can... Uh, execute some source code or whether you can schedule something in the application. Well, that's possible essentially. And what you need to do in order to achieve that, you have the, the current security manager that basically uh, uses permissions. And you need to create a custom type of permission uh, that you can, uh, you can use for that purpose. For example, uh, scheduler, scheduling allowed permissions or something like this. And basically when you create that permission, and register it. Uh, the permission is registered to the policy file that's loaded in the JVM. You you register that permission when you uh, do a call to to set policy. And basically, when you create that custom permission, you can use it basically to do this custom type of permission checking. And based on whether um, you want to do that permission checking for the user, you, let's say you use just to authenticate the user using the login context then you can basically specify uh, attributes of that user in the security policy file along with that custom permission that you created. So you can achieve basically that using that the security model. Yes? Uh, is there something like a restrict all? Restrict all? Uh, like a restrict all is if you uh, install a security manager called set security manager and you don't specify anything in the security policy file. That's basically a restrict all policy. Okay, and what is possible then? What can you do with the restrict all? With the restrict all, basically, you can, you can do everything that the JVM doesn't uh, consider for permission checking. For example, if you do uh, a write to a file system using an output stream, that's not allowed. But if you, for example, uh, do create a for loop and print something, this is allowed because the JVM doesn't do permission checking with the security manager. So with a restrict all policy, basically, you can do everything that the JVM doesn't uh, permission check. Any other questions? Uh, the restrict all essentially. Yeah. Uh, in fact, yes, yeah, yeah. Any questions? If not, then thank you for for your attention.